Teen Vogue on Snapchat encourages teenagers to start sexting during coronavirus lockdown. Then we're also going to talk about the question, does the United States have the most cases of coronavirus in the world, which has been the circulating rumor this last week. We're going to address that and also are poor people immune to coronavirus as a Mexican official is saying. Then we're going to speak about Tiger King. Did Carol feed her husband to a tiger? All that and more on this episode of Deconstructing the Culture. I am your host, Elisa Steele. Welcome to this week's episode, what feels like day 5,000, 1,300,000. You know, I'm just kidding with you. No, it just feels like we've been doing this coronavirus for a really long time, especially the lockdown. And you know, it just is interesting too. It's be, it's felt like it's been happening for so long and has been such insanity in our, in our lives and in our world that it almost feels normal. And I'm trying to remember what life was like before we're all intensely focused on this. And it kind of just goes to show how quickly we as humans adapt to things and it becomes the new normal. Whereas if you think about the situation and just how bizarre it is, if we had, if I had told you, or if I had told myself last November around Thanksgiving time that this is what our life would look like in 2020 and half of our world would be shut down or in some kind of lockdown or self-quarantine. I would have probably believed it as quickly as I would have believed aliens coming to visit us. It's that wild. Um, but anyways, before we go ahead and dive into this week's episode, which I believe you will enjoy, I try hard, especially lately, to make them um, informative, but also light and fun just to keep you entertained. We don't need to bring any more anxiety into our lives at this point. If anything, we'll just bring in some relevant cultural information uh, that's affecting our lives around us, keep us entertained while we also learn how the world is coping to, <laughs> to today's madness. So uh, I actually really want to give a quick shout out to Tangren17. I don't know if I'm going to if I'm pronouncing that right, but I believe it's a she. Thank you, whether you're a she or he, I think I think she left a beautiful and really, really lovely review for the podcast on iTunes, which I really appreciate. They wrote five stars, refreshing, and wrote, super thankful to have found this podcast. Elisa nailed it on the topic of body positivity, and it's so refreshing to find other conservative voices out there in our left-leading culture. Looking forward to listening to more episodes. Thank you so much. Seriously, shout out to you for being awesome. Thank you for listening. And thank you even more for taking the time to leave a review and write that out, not just leaving the five stars, but also to write that out. I, as a listener, a fellow listener of podcasts, know that I pretty much have to feel strongly to, to leave a five-star review. I have to really like that person, like their content. And then to actually write something um, is just quite a step forward. That's not just one step forward. That's like six steps forward. So thank you. I, I don't take that lightly. That just means a lot to me. So thank you for the kind review. And if you haven't already left a review, go ahead and subscribe. Leave a review on iTunes is especially important. If you're on YouTube, if you actually want to go ahead and hit subscribe and then hit the bell icon for notifications nowadays on YouTube, subscriptions don't mean a whole lot. You can be subscribed to a lot of people. YouTube kind of just drowns that out, becomes a noisy mess. So hit that notification button. That's going to tell you when the podcast comes out every week and any special episodes that come out you're not going to want to miss. Now, also, I want to give a sad but short tribute to all of the March babies. I know, worst time to have a month, a birthday during the month of March, and probably I'm going to wish a tribute to the, the April babies, too. I know this because I'm a March baby, and I'm telling you, we were going to go to Disney for my birthday this month, but we were already concerned about the approaching coronavirus issue, and the fact is, is Disney is a huge international draw from all over the world in massive numbers, and so we were thinking, especially with me being pregnant, although I didn't tell you all at the time because I hadn't announced yet, but also knowing that we're expecting our first child, you know, first one we'll, we'll get to meet Earthside, obviously, second child that we've been able to you know, spiritually meet, but knowing that we're, you know, expecting, we also decided based on that information, not to go to Disney and not to expose ourselves to coronavirus. Hindsight, that's probably a good idea, but I'm sorry to y'all who have had March birthdays 
even more than that though, birthdays are nothing. I'm looking around at my friends who are having to either cancel, reschedule, or like make a, a Facebook live wedding. I'm so sorry for you brides and grooms whose weddings are having to be canceled or totally overshadowed by this. I am really sorry. And to a very small degree, I feel like I can feel your pain. I don't know when this is going to end. I don't know how or even if my husband and I will be able to have a baby shower, which is something that you really look forward to, especially for your first kid. So I kind of get it a little bit. It's um, different, a different world than I would have expected to, to give birth to a child in. But all that in perspective, God always has a plan. Uh, we, knows how, we know how the story ends. So yeah, it's all in God's hands. Now let's go ahead. We're going to hit a few just very concisely. We're going to hit some headlines and then we're going to move into mm, the more entertaining portion where we talk about Tiger King. And also I'm going to give you a list of top shows or not top shows, top movies that I recommend during quarantine time while you have all this extra time on your hands, maybe to watch movies. I'm going to give you my top list. I think it's top 10 favorite movies. So Let's start off with um, our headlines. So British scientific advisors are claiming that China's outbreak could be 15 to 40 times worse than reported. Now, I bring this up specifically because this week, the, I wanted, the headlines over most news organizations and media outlets has been the US has the most confirmed cases of coronavirus. Now the key word in that is confirmed cases. Well, here's the thing. The U.S. has also done the most testing for coronavirus. So, of course, if we're testing at a higher rate more quickly, then yes, we are going to have a higher rate of confirmed cases because we can confirm them. But the truth is, China has a lot more cases. We know this because China consistently lies about a lot of things. They have a record and they lied in the past about the SARS virus and how they lied about those numbers. There have been whistleblowers talking about this, um, leaking from China, saying that those numbers are not correct. We also know that China's a communist dictatorship. Of course they're lying. Of course they're kicking out journalists from around the world. Of course they're in control of the media. And the truth is, is just little sneaky facts that kind of stick out to you, like how they opened all the movie theaters and then closed them all again, tells you that they're not being honest about even a secondary wave happening in China. Now, I don't think we're ever going to get the truth, the God's honest truth about what's happening in China and what those numbers are. But what we do know is that their numbers are much higher than what they're reporting. And because of their population and how badly it broke out there originally, my guess is they still hold the record for most cases, just not the most confirmed cases, um, especially because they're not giving those numbers here. Uh, quoted from these British scientific advisors, they say, quote, Mr. Johnson has been warned by scientific advisors that China's officially declared statistics on the number of cases of coronavirus could be downplayed by a factor of 15 to 40 times, the Daily Mail reported. And the British government believes that China is seeking to build its economic power during the pandemic with predatory offers of help to countries around the world. There have been various reports of China sending masks and tests that aren't working, that aren't effective, that, that are just trying to, to push themselves up and make themselves look better than they are by first lying about the numbers of infected and deaths and then sending predatory offers of help saying, hey, we're going to help you. We're going to look all generous, but their tests aren't working or their masks aren't working. So that kind of just shows you a little bit of China's character. So when you hear that news and when you see that, and especially when you see some of our mainstream leftist media kind of almost gleeful that America has the highest number of reported or recorded confirmed cases, it's almost like them saying, see, America sucks because then they don't love America anyways. But don't take it seriously. We just, thank goodness, are taking this as seriously as we can as a country and are testing at the highest rate we can, hopefully more in the future so we can end this economic standstill. If we can test as many people as is possible, we can get people more into the workforce and out of that. But next, we're going to, next headline, I just want to mention this. I wasn't thinking about talking about this, but I am so shocked absolutely disgusted and shocked. But Joe Biden, he had a, what looks to me like a pretty credible 
accusation of sexual assault by a woman um, who says that he sexually assaulted her and abused her in the 90s. And, you know, without getting too graphic, basically, uh, first she reported him for, for sexual harassment. Um, and then later he sexually abused her, sexually assaulted her, and she did tell two family members at the time. Now, we don't have any proof that this happened. And I'm not going to go around saying, of course, she's telling the truth. But I'm saying it's reasonably plausible that maybe she's telling the truth, especially because we've seen his super creepy behavior with being overly friendly towards women and to little girls. I, I really wouldn't put it past him. I think it's at least worth considering that this is the case and that this is a credible accusation, but our mainstream media has refused to cover this, or if they cover it, it's been so brief and then buried, and they're not talking about this, but just a second ago, I don't know, like last year when Brett Kavanaugh had a way less credible accusation from a woman who couldn't even get her friends to say that this happened or that she had told anybody anybody about the supposed accusation that didn't make any sense at all and yet we were told believe all women in fact during that time both biden was quoted um as to have said quote for a woman to come forward he said this in general about women coming forward for a woman to come forward in the glaring lights of focus nationally you've got to start off with the presumption that at least the essence of what she's saying of what she's talking about is real whether or not she forgets facts whether or not it's been made worse or better over time, but nobody fails to understand that this is like jumping into a cauldron. Biden said that to reporters, and yet he's not even considering this woman. Here he is telling us, in essence, to believe all wo women, that if a woman comes forward, she's jumping into a cauldron, as he puts it, and that we should believe that the essence of it is true. Um, but then she, he, he's not taking that and applying that to himself. When she's jumping into the cauldron of this, where where is he championing championing her and championing her voice to talk about her sexual abuse at his hands? Just ridiculous. And I bring this up specifically because our mainstream media is not talking about it. So of course I'm going to bring it up. All right. Before I continue on, next we're actually going to talk about the Mexi a Mexican governor who said that poor people are immune, which is disgusting. And then also Teen Vogue on Snapchat encouraging teens to start sexting. Before I talk about that real quick, I'm gonna ask you to please remember to subscribe, leave a review, share this with a friend, especially one who needs to know what's going on culturally with coronavirus but doesn't wanna to be totally overwhelmed with panic information. Just send this to somebody who needs something interesting to listen to today, all right? Anyways, after you subscribed and left a review, let's go ahead and talk about Mexico right now. Now. First off, we know that Mexican, the Mexican government is corrupt. And I have spoken about this at length. If you um, listen to, I probably, I think like 100% certain, the longest episode I ever did was about the attack on my LeBaron family in Mexico that happened last November. And I in depth talked about the Mexican government and my feelings on that and their corruption. But gross lie just shoved in our face and just kind of just shows you where their government's at. It's the fact that their governor said, um, so, so just to, to cap, last information I have is Mexico has over 800 confirmed cases as of Sunday morning. And Governor Luis Miguel Barros of the state of Puebla, southeast of Mexico City said, quote, the majority are wealthy people. And he's in this instance, he's referring to a recent government report that found three quarters of the country's cases are people who return from international travel. Duh. Then he says, quote, if you are rich, you are at risk. He said in a news conference that was broadcast live on YouTube and Facebook, if you are poor, no. We poor people, we are immune. Oh my goodness. The only reason why we're able to bring this under scrutiny and shout the outrage that it, this ridiculous statement and terribly terribly misleading statement by a government official a governor can you imagine if one of our governors did that it would ruin their reputation and political career for the rest of their life but the truth is, is the fact that this guy is saying this on youtube and facebook is the reason why we can spark outrage over this but it, the truth is is this kind of stuff is probably happening in China, but much worse. The fact that China had whistleblowers saying that this is concerning back in November and December and China was shutting them down. We just don't have this on 
YouTube and Facebook for us to criticize. But I can tell you right now, corrupt things happen when you have governments that are this corrupt and this dysfunctional. And I just kind of wish we had, I wish we could show China for the frauds that they are, especially when they've come out, you know, in the last, in the last few weeks now trying to blame coronavirus on the United States. It's disgusting. Take responsibility for your stuff. In Mexico, quit lying to your people. Don't allow your, your, your governor to do this. This is ridiculous and just lying to, lying to the citizens of Mexico. All right, now, most disturbing headline of today, and I feel like, I feel like I, I feel like I say this all the time. If you have children or teenagers, they really don't need to be on social media. And I know that that's not, that flies in the face of many of my audiences. <laughs> many of my audience listening, even right now, you're probably 14 or 15 listening to my podcast or watching this on YouTube and being like, uh, Elisa, um, well, that's how we know you. We follow you on Facebook. We follow you on Instagram, whatever. I'm just going to be straight up with you. If you never saw my page again or never listened to my podcast again, and that meant and that happened because you were completely off social media altogether, that would be worth it to me. I don't think most people need to be on social media, especially not to the degree. I think that's the main part. It's fine to be on it to an extent, but to the degree that we're on it. And then honestly, I think if you're under the age of 18, you really shouldn't be on it at all. Two reasons. A, it's full of filth. It's not a matter of if you'll be introduced to it. It's a matter of when you'll be introduced to it. And B, um... I don't think that you as teenagers have the wisdom to know what to post on online and what to not post. I don't think you understand at that age, no matter how much you think you understand, I don't think you understand that what is there is permanent and forever and can never be erased. There's no such thing as a Snapchat disappearing picture and it's never seen again. No, that is archived. That is there for ever. The permanence is so intense, many adults don't understand it, but especially not teenagers and children. I don't believe teenagers and children should have social media at all, period, end of story. I know it sounds extreme and my kids are probably going to hate me. They're not going to have social media. They probably won't even have their own cell phone until they're 16 and they're driving and I'll give them a flip phone. But the truth is, is you don't need social media. Case in point, is you're going to be exposed to and potentially act on the terrible crap, crap, crap media that you see on Snapchat and Teen Vogue. Teen Vogue in the name is targeting teenagers and they're encouraging teens to sex during the coronavirus lockdown. Now, teen, uh, the, the chat ads, their headlines are of course very enticing and they do, quote, how to sex, the best tips and tricks and like anything worth doing, sexting takes practice. Oh, really? All right then, you wanna tell teenagers, children, underaged individuals, how to take sexually explicit images that in many states are considered child porn? Huh, that's real smart. Don't even try and tell me, oh, this is, this is for older people who are of legal age, because that's what you're gonna say, some, some BS about that to, to protect you legally. But no, it's in your name, Teen Vogue, and most teenagers are gonna be under the age of 18. Now, the advice is especially explicit and disgusting. Writing, writing here, quote, sending someone details about what you want to do to them and getting back even more detail about what they want to do to you should be fun, easy, and ultimately joyful. Anything less than that isn't worth your time. And seven tips. This article is, is, is disgusting. I'm not even going to read it in full. But something I want to point out is the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, and they tweeted, encouraging teens to sex is encouraging minors to create and distribute child sex abuse material. They're absolutely correct. They continue also, online predators use social media to pose as peers and groom children to sex with them and then to distribute the material and blackmail it with them. And you're going to think, maybe you as a listener, maybe you're not super Maybe you're not super knowledgeable about this industry. And I'm not an expert either, but I spent years researching this and reading up on this and getting to know the facts and becoming familiar with it. And you're gonna, you know, you're welcome to go back and listen to my podcast episodes, No Porn or No Pornography November and um, Porn Pornography Kills Love. I talk about in depth the effect of pornography on the brain, but specifically the fact is, is it's not uncommon. 
it is not uncommon for children and teenagers to be sex trafficked in the United States, both physically and through images. And much of it does happen over sites like Snapchat that gather pictures and videos of children doing these acts because they're they're talking to somebody they think is their own age and they're in love with them and they're they they're groomed by these predators and this is very very common this is not this crazy story that's far removed this is happening in every neighborhood in every city in every state of the united states and it is so not uncommon it's sick and it's and i believe that a huge influence on that is snapchat and is Teen Vogue and the, the disgusting social media presence that you're going to find from these, from these places. Now, the National Center on Sexual Exploita Exploitation also writes that research shows that sexting is often linked to offline sexual coercion, leaving teens inherently vulnerable. They also note, additionally, sexting can lead teens to be sexually escorted, sexually abused, or trafficked. Sexting is not harmless or fun, as Teen Vogue would have teenagers think, and Teen Vogue and Snapchat would be wise to stop promoting sexting to young, impressionable teens. Teen Vogue advised their advice for handling relationships during coronavirus lockdown appears on a number of platforms, including on the magazine's website, which encourages teens to invest in new couplings, even if they can't go on physical dates. So their advice is, oh, you're 14, 15, 16, you can't go on a physical date, but don't worry, you should still engage in sexual activity with strangers online. Yeah, because that's totally smart for anyone, including adults, not. Um, now, something that they wrote specifically, which is disgusting to me, is if you're in the early stages of romance, this is Teen Vogue, you, oh, and you still can't forge an emotional bond with your new beau by text, oh, you still can, I accidentally added a T when I was editing, you still can forge an emotional bond while with your new boo by texting and FaceTime. There are all kinds of creative, fun ways to sext if you're at that level. And of course, they add if you're at that level, but they're not saying specifically, by the way, you should be, I don't know, 18 or older and preferably legally married. <laughs> no, they're not going to write that. That's not what they're promoting. Um, they continue in a catch-all article on sustaining relationships during isolation. Teen Vogue still considers sending news as a revolutionary act, and they wrote, quote, Every time we exchange a nude with care and respect, if that's what we want to do, the stigma diminishes just a little so, one, so that one glorious day it will no longer work to blackmail someone with sexual images. Happy sexting. <sighs> Revolting. This is not appropriate. This is not even appropriate for an adult. Mm -hmm. It's much, much worse and quite frankly encouraging child pornography when you write this to teenagers and children. Again. Parents, your children don't need to be on social media. They'll be just fine to make friends and keep friends and communicate with friends in real life. They don't need social media. And if you are a teen watching, you really don't need social media either. Trust me, I survived without it until I was almost an adult. Your life is better off without it. And if you can find it within yourself to have the self-control to get off and to stay off, I can almost with 100% certainty guarantee your life will be better for it, not worse. All right, now moving on to a happier, higher note, and then we're going to close out. I'm going to give you 10 of my favorite movies. At least I think it's 10. I'd count, but that would take quite too long. So you count while I'm going along. Movies that I love and you can watch over and over and I highly recommend if you're in the mood. Now, granted, this is not a list for everyone. There are a few rated R movies on here. So this is not like a list for everyone, every age, every personality, and whatever. Go at your own risk. Look up the rating or whatever. Make sure it's a good fit for you. Now, Anne of Green Gables, the old school one, not the cruddy one you're going to find on Netflix, like Anne with an E. And I don't like, I have to specify, there are three Anne of Green Gable movies. Don't remember what year they came out in. But I like number one and number two, Anne of Green Gables and Anne of Avonlea. Now, Anne, whatever the third one is, don't like that one at all. Sucks. Don't watch it. Just the first two. Okay. Pride and Prejudice. Love this, but it has to be like the super, super long BBC version that came out in 1995, I think. Love that show. I have watched it so many times over my life and I'll probably watch it again in the near future and make my poor husband suffer through it with me. But it's so good, especially if you love Pride and Prejudice. The book, it almost line by line follows it. It's really, really good. 
All right, Sense and Sensibility, love that one. The Scarlet Pimpernel, I think it came out in the early 2000s is the version, because I know there's a few different versions of that. Uh, Les Miserables, 2012 version, love that. Music's really good. Sound of Music, classic. Love the Sound of Music. Schindler's List, have to be in the mood for that one, but if you're in the mood for a really long, deep, heavy one, that one's one of the ones that's rated R, but it's R for a reason, and it's really good. That's, you know, watch at your own risk. Next couple, I don't remember what Hacksaw Ridge is rated, but I really, really enjoyed Hacksaw Ridge. If you like war movies, very moving. Gladiator, I'm sorry, I <laughs> love Gladiator. It is so good. Again, another rated R, but there's only a few rated Rs that I'm willing to watch, and that's one of them. Another couple that are rated R that I really love is The Patriot with Mel Gibson. Another Mel Gibson is Braveheart. I love Braveheart. My husband had never seen Braveheart until we got married, and then I had him watch it, and he's like, why have I never seen this? And I was like, I don't know. But Braveheart, love it. Mel Gibson, amazing. I'm not super into the violence. So like, I use the skip button a little bit, always have, um, to kind of just skip a couple minutes here and there during the really violent parts, but love that movie. It's been told to me in my family that I am obviously very distantly related to William Wallace. Don't know if that's true, but that's what my aunt said one time, so I'm going with it. A um, couple more is Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. Charming, charming movie. The music is amazing. If you love classic older shows, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. Old for me. If you're like an old person listening to this, you're going to be like, uh, what do you think is old, Lisa? You're such a child. I'll be like, yeah, I am. And then the last but not least is My Fair Lady. Love this one. Again, those last two I listed, Seven Brides with Seven Brothers and My Fair Lady are both movies that my husband had never seen until we got married and he watched them. And he actually really loves both of them, which is awesome. So uh, while we're on the subject, pause the video right now and go ahead and list three of your favorite must-watch movies for coronavirus in the comments and let me see if I can go check them out and I'll let you know what I think. I'll hopefully if I can go watch them I'll reply to yours and let you know what I think. Although I do want to add please don't find any rated R. Probably won't watch them. I'm very very picky about rated R movies that I'll watch. I'm actually really picky about PG-13 nowadays. Nowadays a lot of PG-13 is like whoa there Nelly. How many times do I need to skip this again? So, yeah, comment at your own risk and watch other people's recommendations at your own risk, including mine. All right, now, speaking of movies, we've got to talk about this, okay? Lion King. We've all seen it. It's about a lion, and he loses his dad, Scar, and it's like a happy ending. But have you seen Tiger King? It doesn't have nearly as happy of an ending as The Lion King, because I'm telling you, actually, everyone's miserable in Tiger King, and they're all freaking nuts. Wow. Now, I do want to tell you, watch at your own risk. If you haven't seen it, you might want to just skip a few and then end with Good in the World. If you don't want any giveaways or spoilers, you can just go ahead and skip. If you've ever seen Tiger King, I need to know right now. Comment right now. Do you think Carol Baskin killed her husband? Comment right now in the comments. Okay, I'm going to go check those. Take a vote. Did Carol Baskin kill her husband? and feed him to the tigers. All right, now, full disclosure, gonna talk about the, the, the TV series, Tiger King. I have to say, I am so glad I found this. I wasn't going to watch it until I saw so many of my friends watching, and I was like, all right, I'll give this a try. Really glad I did. I have been suffering by watching cruddy TV shows and trying to find something good for a while. I was for a while trying to watch Poldark, terrible show. I feel like I could make an entire monologue no, an entire YouTube video that's like three hours long of all the times they have people just staring off into the ocean or staring off into nowhere. It's like half of every episode. Don't watch Poldark, it stinks. But on a happy note, I did binge watch, the, binge watch this week, Tiger King, quality entertainment. It's like watching a train wreck. It's like watching like seven ways to ruin your life by raising tigers and then creating a feud and then killing your husband, feeding him to tigers and then hiring somebody to go kill your work. I mean, it's a train wreck, but so satisfyingly entertaining. It makes my family history with polygamy and murder and cults, it actually kind of makes it look a little bit tame. Maybe, kinda, not really, but still crazy, okay? Now, my key takeaways for Tiger King. Carol Baskin totally killed her husband. And if you think that she didn't, if you commented in the comments just now that Carol didn't kill her husband and feed her, feed him to the tigers, I don't know if we watched the same show, because I feel like it's pretty clear Carol totally killed her husband, 
and he was Tiger Lunch, okay? Now, next takeaway. Joe Exotic is nuts, and he more than likely did so. It send somebody to kill Carol. And if he didn't, the intent and threats were so intense for so long, I feel like he's fully capable. He was eventually going to snap, okay? So, yeah, I don't really have any sympathy for him at all. Doc Antle, he is the smartest nut by far of the show and most conniving nut, but he's still a creepy cult leader, nutcase, who kills tigers when he's done with them and preys on teenage girls and young, early 20 girls and coldly holds them in his disgusting grasp. It's, it's pretty gnarly. Not, yeah. I started out watching the show thinking, oh, Doc Antle, he's like the level-headed one. And like, oh, Carol, she's got like the best mission. By the end of the show, you're just like, yeah, no, they all suck. They're all evil. They're all villains. They all deserve everything that's coming for them. And worse, basically everyone's a villain in the show. And that's what makes it such a train wreck, but so entertaining at the same time. The only person who's not an utter train wreck in the entire show that you kind of agree with and you're kind of like, whoa, some sanities here is Rick Kirkham. He's a, he was a producer dude who wears the hat and he produced like the Joe Exotic TV. He's the only one that's mildly sane and you you listen to him and you're like, okay, he knows what he's talking about. He equally calls Joe Exotic crazy and Carol crazy and um, I think he even calls Doc Antle crazy. He basically says they're all nuts and I really regret being involved with him. I really regret like he'll just outright be like, oh yeah, I was in it for the money. Really wish I hadn't. That was a mistake. So even though he's not exactly the best guy, he at least seems the most sane and the only person who you listen to and you're like, okay, yeah, see where you're coming from. You, yep, you're smart. So that's my take on Tiger King. Comment below if you disagree with me on anything and especially did Carol be her husband to the tiger. It's very important, I know. All right, we're gonna end with good in the world. Um, now, I am going to tell you ahead of time, good in the world is maybe not what you would expect, but it gives me hope, and I'll tell you why in just a second. But a very sweet story of a man who was unable to visit his wife for their 67th wedding anniversary, and he gave her a heartwarming tribute outside her nursing home. So because they couldn't be together, he stood outside the window. His name's Bob. He stood outside on the grass and... Um, outside of his wife's nursing home, and he held a sign and an armful or a handful of balloons and a handmade sign that said, I've loved you for 67 years and still do happy anniversary and blew a kiss to his bride. This is so sweet. And I feel like this story needs to be highlighted not only because this is kind and this is sweet and this is heartwarming in a time when many of us can't be with our loved ones. I know that I had loved ones come up from Mexico and then others come down from North Dakota to visit m my family in Utah, specifically my grandfather who is in a, a, a nursing home in Utah. And they weren't, some of them weren't able to see him because he was already in quarantine and they could only wave to him outside his window, which is really sad. But not only is this a sweet and heartwarming story, but it shows you that people made it for 67 years. This couple made it. They made it work. They made their marriage work. And especially, just speaking personally, almost everybody I know, like personally in my life, has been deeply affected by divorce. Their parents are divorced or they are divorced. I mean, my mom um, obviously divorced my father for appropriate and good reasons. I'm not saying she should have stayed with my polygamous father. It's the last thing I would have wished upon her or anyone else. But what I am saying is that those around me, it's been an example of, of divorce. So for me, as a young person, as uh, someone who falls right in between millennials and Gen Xers, depending on what study you look at, I look for hopeful situations. I look for those who have made it work, you know, past the odds, they've beaten the odds, they've more than beaten the odds by 67 years of marriage, and they found love for each other, not just love, but when maybe love failed them, they found their commitment and decided they were going to make marriage work no matter what, even when it was difficult, maybe when they didn't feel like they loved each other anymore. Maybe they didn't love each other for a time. I don't know their story. But all I know is that a whole heck of a lot happens 
an entire lifetime happens in 67 years and they made it work. And to me, that is beautiful. And that is one of the most beautiful and good things in this world that we can look at and aspire to. So that is today's good in the world. God bless Bob Shellard and his wife in their nursing home. Pray for their health and their safety during this time and everyone else who has loved ones in nursing homes. Um, pray for you March babies and for you brides and grooms who are figuring out getting married during this crazy pandemic and for you mamas who are giving birth during all of this just for your safety and health. God bless you. God bless America. God bless our world. This is Deconstructing the Culture. I am your host, Elisa Steele. Hey there. This might be your first episode listening or watching or your 74th episode and beyond. Whichever it is, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for being here and supporting this podcast. It's really, really a big deal. I mean, every listen, every share, every every review, it means a lot and it really helps in the ranking. That's the reason why I can still do this today over a year later of running the podcast. So if you would, please just remember to like, share, leave a review. If you're watching on YouTube, please hit subscribe and also the alert bell, the little icon that has a little flash through it. Make sure that your alarms are on for this channel. And then if you are on YouTube, for sure, make sure that you're subscribed and leave a five-star review. It especially matters on iTunes. Thank you so much. God bless you.